Hello, everyone. Thanks for staying. I'm the last man standing between you and the, and the party, I guess. So we're going we're gonna to be quick. Um, so yeah, I'd like to talk um, to you about some uh, lessons we learned when uh, developing WebP. So I'm Pascal. I'm working with the WebP team at uh, Google Engineer. And uh, what we can use to what we learned uh, to maybe design another better format for images uh, that would rely on some of the tools of AV1, for instance. So let's get started. I'm going to probably uh, go fast on the first part because we are a little bit late and uh, maybe spend more time on the research directions and propose what we propose to look at for a better image format uh, from one we learned from the, the WebP uh, v1. Uh, and then I'm, maybe I'm going to have some time to do a little bit of demo and show some results. So let's get started quickly. So if you look at the, at the image format that we, we talked about, Cyril talked about, uh, most of them are based on video uh, codec, VP8 for WebP, uh, HVC for HIF, et cetera, AV1 for AVIF. Um, so is it always a good choice? Do we have always the, the right set of tools when we take a video codec and try to make it into an image codec? Um, some of them are good. But some uh, of the, the tools uh, or the format are not really fit for an uh, image application. So when I'm talking about image compression, and I need to, to distinguish between two cases, which I think are important. Um, the one I would call it the capture use case, which is when you take a photo of, uh, with your device and try to upload it as fast as possible. Usually it's high quality, uh, and uh, you don't have things like transparency. And it's it's fairly large uh, dimension, for instance, and resolution, and you want to get this as fast as possible on your storage or CDN. So that might be the use case for taking a photo on uh, on your phone. And then there is the kind of the WebP use case, which is web consumption. What since in a CDN you want to consume this uh, image at different formats, uh, different resolution, and uh, it's not necessarily a, a very high quality version of it. It's not necessarily a version you upload it to the CDN. And this is what I would call the, the WebP use case, the web consumption. And this is the one we are focused on uh, for WebP and maybe for the next format we're interested in. Um, so yeah, I like to, to emphasize on this distinction between the capture format and the, and the web consumption. And I'm going to focus on the second one. So um, a web image format, uh, there is some pack peculiarities. And uh, when you come from a video codec, there is some friction points, actually, that makes the format not very suitable. Uh, with some aspects on the image format. So what we learn from an uh, image standpoint is that the thing that are important for image and not necessarily uh, present um, adequately in a video format are mostly the incremental decoding. Because when you're consuming on a web an image, most of the time you don't have all the data or if it's downloading. And you want to show as much as you can to the user, even if you have only partial data. So you have to architecture your codec around this incremental decoding. You want to show as much as possible. You're going to be interrupted. You won't have all the data. You want to suspend the decoding. So are you going to do that efficiently? Um, then you have to look at the memory consumption also. Uh, Cyril mentioned that, for instance, you're decoding 20 images at the same time uh, when you land on a page. And you want to be very memory efficient. If you instantiate a video codec for each of these images, and each of the codec instantiate all the reference buffer, you're going to consume a lot of memory just for single images. So you have to be careful with that. And for instance, WebP scales the memory as the size of the width of the image only, because we have a kind of a scan line of prediction that goes like this. We never have the full buffer at the same time in memory. We optimize for that. Um, we also want to optimize for the overhead of the format. Like we want to have the smallest container as possible, because people, they encode, for, for instance, images one by one pixel transparent as marker. and it, it costs 20 bytes, for instance, or 30 bytes with WebP. And we want to be very uh, if efficient on the container and just allow the minimum uh, useful features. Because for image with, uh, which is exposed on a browser, security reason, we want to be, we want, don't want to have flexibility on the format. Like flexibility is a liability most of the time for uh, on the web. Uh, so we want to be very strict on the, what you can do and what you can store. And also, as I mentioned, for the showing as much data as possible, uh, as fast as possible to the user. We want to be very efficient on the way we represent data uh, in, the, in the container. For instance, if you put the alpha data uh, separate from the uh, YUV, then you will have to wait to decode all the alpha data to be able to show something. Whereas if you interleave 
the YUV and the alpha into the same bitstream, then you can show blocks as fast as possible. And same, if you put the ICC profile at the end of the file, then you have to wait for all the decoding, decode the ICC and then show the, the modified uh, samples. So you want to be very uh, strict about where to put the, the data and how to put them. Um, also, um, we want to be efficient on alpha because that's not something you have on a capture format. No, no device can capture alpha. It's a human process that puts the alpha. And then we want to be very efficient, also interleave the alpha with the YUV. Lossless coding is useful also. Uh, it's the replacement for PNG, for instance. We want to have preview and uh, in, in the format also, and very light animation format that does not consume any memory, that only needs one buffer to be decoding. And most of all, we want to be efficient in software because hardware is not that useful for images because you cannot parallelize the decoding of 20 images, for instance, on a page. Uh, you have to be able to suspend uh, the hardware implementation. They don't assume that you can have partial data and so on. So we want to focus on software um, and we want to focus on incremental decoding, lightweight memory and small over it. So that would be web PV2. Uh, so pretty much like V1, all the same feature we don't need much more. Uh, we need more compression. That's why we want to borrow to from AV1. And we want to be very fast. Uh, and uh, as Cyril shows some, uh, some uh, results, and we want to stay at that level. And we want to add HDR because uh, our 10 bit support, because that's, that's very useful for the web or for the next web. So what we're going to do differently for, uh, from AV1 with that respect, we want to keep the transforms, for instance, and the filtering. They are pretty good tools. Um, the block, we want to modify that, maybe. And um, also, we want to introduce some uh, kind of research direction, uh, something unusual, maybe that would improve the image coding and not necessarily the video coding. All right. Um, so I'm going to talk mostly about maybe the most promising one is the floating partitioning. And also, maybe the rest uh, we experimented with. And not of all of them. Uh, really works, or some some of the experiments we did didn't work so far, but uh, hopefully maybe they, they will work uh, someday. Um, so I'm going to go quickly into some of them, uh, and most of the most promising one is the the floating partitioning, which I'm going to spend most more time on. So let's get to it. Uh, so for instance, this is the the way partition is done in AV1. I just dumped the partitioning. So you see the, the traditional blocks. It's at low quality. So you have some fairly large blocks. And what we want to do is like allow this block to be uh, not aligned to 32 by 32 or super blocks like 64 by 64, but just like be spread anywhere on image to better fit the, the geometry. So we want to have some uh, floating points uh, floating point, <laughs> floating partitioning. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> floating partitioning, where you can put the blocks uh, everywhere. So, I mean, it's it's not that different uh, syntactically because you just like, when you want to transmit the block, you just say, uh, here's the size for the next block. And you process in, a, for instance, lexicographic order, like from top to uh, to right and top to bottom, sorry. And you just say, uh, next block is that size, et cetera. And you fill the, the gaps the here. So for instance, I put some number of the, the decoding order here. And you see the number three is a, is a very large one. Uh, and then you're going to have to fill the, the blocks. So you see that there is a first uh, advantage to that. For instance, the, when you decode the block num uh, number three, so you don't have all the left samples, but when you decode the block number seven, you have some samples on the right that are already decoded. right? Uh, so we want to explore that to have a, a more um, samples available at the boundary to predict better from that because of this order. right? Uh, and then going forward, with that, we can try to have a passing order that is different than the uh, decoding order of the blocks. You can buffer the geometry. And at some point, you say you look at the queue and say, OK, now you decode these blocks in that order. And you can, you can have some different strategy to maximize, uh, maximize, for instance, the left sample availability. Because for instance, when I, I said the, the block number three doesn't have all the left samples, you can try to work on that and, for instance, have a different order uh, of passing and decoding to maximize uh, the number of samples. So you have, for instance, you decode the free first block, and then you realize you don't have the left samples. So you, you keep on going the decoding, uh, the passing, but not the decoding. So you decode, you pass the block four, five, and six. They all don't have the complete left samples. And when you arrive and you realize old queue has the, all the left samples available, then you can flush, and then you decode the blocks 
uh, three, four, five. And then you realize you still not have all the left samples available for this big block. So you keep on uh, passing the bit stream six and seven, and then you have all the samples on the left. And then you can flush and keep on like this. So it's kind of a different passing and decoding order to maximize the left. But you can think of any uh, or, uh, availability uh, um, strategy for that um, that would change the order of decoding. So one thing we we have some constraints here because I talked about the memory and we want to like, the largest block is 32 by 32, and uh, we have tiles of 256, and we want to decode in a rolling fashion. We want to have a buffer that is 32 by the tile width, and that's it. We don't want to uh, go over this uh, memory buffer. So you have some constraint that you cannot like decode a block that is outside, and uh, to keep this rolling uh, buffer uh, um, feature. That is very important safety that we have in web pv1 so it would put some constraint for example the block number three cannot have any size there is some constraint to not overflow the 32 uh, eighth uh, buffer size okay so the problem with the flooding partitioning is that the search space is huge now and uh, doing rd opt with that uh, when you can lay it out uh, blocks anywhere you want is uh, is very difficult and uh, we haven't cracked it for for now because there's so many possibilities but one algo we, we use, which works pretty well, is to use the variance and uh, to put some blocks on an image that fits uh, a consistent variance um, on, the, on the image. So for instance, you take the variance of a, of a block, a 32 by 32 block, by, by a unit of 4 by 4, and then you, you bucketize that by assigning uh, some numbers, or bucket numbers to the variance. And then you just you have these uh, buckets and you try to put the largest block you can that has the same uniform uh, variance bucket. And then you proceed from the largest to the smallest like this. So uh, this is a super nice drawing of uh, what it is, what it does. And then it gives you some partitioning that kind of respects the, the, the variance. Uh, that you have. So this is, this is pretty quick and uh, it works. Um, variance is not a good metrics necessarily. And this is kind of a go, they, they put too much small blocks on the, on the gaps and it's not always a good strategy. Uh, and that's still a lot of over I go to, 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 to try. So the thing is with these uh, floating partitioning is like you're trading the geometry to save on the residual. That's kind of the balance we want to have. We're gonna spend more bits on the geometry in order to reduce the residuals because you better fit the image. Um, so speaking of residual coding, uh, there is another, I talked about uh, having some very small memory footprint and be able to suspend the bit stream. So if you have large context adaptive symbols, and you want to have, uh, for instance, use checkpoints to be able to resume the decoding, you're going to have to set all the context for later resuming. And it's a lot of things. So we want to have a residual coding that uh, is very light, that doesn't need context, and is very efficient. So we have this idea of using the of signaling, the bonding box of the, of the largest non-zero coefficient that you have. So it's safe, for instance, on the zigzag, because once you've signaled the, the red bonding box that only contains the non-zero coefficient, then you don't have to code the zeros that are outside of the bonding box on the zigzag order. So it saves a lot of zeros already. And then you have another trick that you can use. It's like, you are pretty sure that the end of block bit is gonna be on the boundary of the bonding box. Uh, so you only have a few positions where you can potentially have an end of block and you, you, you save the signaling inside of the box which cannot have an end of block bit in there. And we use that adaptive bit, of, of course. And for instance, there's another trick, you can signal whether you find a, a one, whether it's the last, and all the, res the remaining coefficient is gonna be all ones. And it happens quite often. Okay. So this is all the things we, we used. And uh, they saved a lot of in context, you have no context. It's just adaptive probability everywhere. No memory, you can, uh, yeah, it doesn't use anything. Uh, another direction we tried is like custom uh, color space transforms because on a per type basis even, and uh, it works. I mean, it's something uh, for some image, it, uh, it kind of like when you have a special tint in an image, it captures that using principal uh, decomposition uh, component analysis uh, to find the best uh, transform. It's just a matrix multiplication by per pixel, but it's, it's pretty okay. Uh, it gives good results. Um, I talk about a very peculiar uh, thing for image, which is the a mix of alpha, where you can have, for instance, for the, the image you find on a web, the logos, you have a mix of, uh, of smooth alpha mask and a plain alpha mask. So in web PV1, we use the lossless, pure lossless compression for the alpha mask, because we wanted to, to preserve all the details, but we realized that mixing lossy and lossless can be useful because, for instance, 
you, you can use lossy only on the boundaries of, of a mask and it compresses better than using lossless and you can keep lossless for all the rest. So we use this mix of uh, lossy and lossless and it works pretty well. Actually, they use predictors like this. Um, I talked about preview. Uh, preview can use fun days, but we, we did some research and actually using triangle based preview is pretty, uh, it's pretty efficient. Uh, we want to put like 300 bytes in the header uh, to represent a, a thumbnail. And uh, so you can see this uh, representation is based on triangles. We only, for instance, we have a small grid. We have a, a very small color map of five colors. And uh, we just signal on the, on the grid whether we want to use that for triangle or not, whether it's a vertice or not. And then you get this kind of preview, which is pretty efficient. Um, okay. So that's one of the direction we, we, we tried. There is a lot. Um, I have some, uh, I can talk more in uh, other direction we tried, but for the sake of time, I'm going to go to the results. Um, so sometimes it works. I mean, uh, surprisingly OK for uh, large images. Uh, WebP is uh, the orange one. Uh, WebPV2 is the green one. And AV1, or AVIF, is the, is the, is the blue one. Uh, so sometimes we're getting close uh, for the fraction of uh, the complexity. Uh, sometimes it works okay-ish, okay, let's say, it's, uh, and sometimes it doesn't work, it's just no better than what be so far. But we have a lot to explore on the, the floating partitioning algorithm. You can think that the partitioning on this kind of image is, can be fairly difficult because it's a fairly complex image. Um, and we pay attention to the, the web image, that means the atypical image you find on the web, this kind of, of ads or something. And uh, we want to be good for this. So actually, this one is pretty good. The blue is WebP2, actually. So this is the kind of image we also pay attention to, like not the nice photos, et cetera, but also what you find on the web for good. Um, to compare to AV1, we, use, uh, we, we, uh, we, we break down by syntactic uh, component, for instance, the blocks, the, coef, uh, the prediction modes, et cetera. And this is unusual representation. We have the PSNR on the x-axis and uh, the size on the on the wise kind of the rd curve but flip but it's good to uh, to uh, for comparing for instance so so you have the breakdown of uh, every one bitstream for several qualities you see the residual growing it's the green one and you compare that to web pv2 for instance and you see where we break down and uh, i mentioned exchanging geometry data for lowering the residuals this is the kind of uh, curve we look at uh for instance yeah what what change between everyone and you where where the balance is of uh, where we use bits and where we don't um right so let's talk a little bit of but uh, a quick uh, speed uh, test i did on the on the mac uh so i compared to jpeg which is kind of the reference and i tried to encode uh with webp webp2 and av1 so you see, we're still far away from WebP, but it's just the C version. It's not, it doesn't been optimized, right? Uh, WebPV2 and uh, AV1 is the is the uh, libaom. Uh, so yeah, we, we kind of faster encoding, and we are um, uh, quite slower at decoding. Actually, all the I don't know why the blocks has sh uh, shifted. It's actually the two last columns that you should be looking at. I don't know why the uh, the Green boxes are off by one color. So you, you look at the two last column, and uh, the one before the end is the encoding speed, and the last column is the decoding speed. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, I don't know why they are shifted. Um, if I have time, I'd like to show you a, a video of the, the tools we have uh, in the viewer. Uh, is it OK? Oh. Adrian? Yeah, All right, OK. Uh, where is, is there? So um, yeah, instead of, I, I could do the demo live, but I don't trust that, it never works. Uh, so I just recorded a video on YouTube, actually showing the tools and uh, what, do I, what do I do that? Sorry, uh, going full screen, I was probably gonna. Yeah. Right, uh, okay, let's do that like this. Oh, OK. Uh, so yeah, this is the view where we have for the tools I mentioned. So it's, it, we can explore all the tools and see the, the contribution of respectively and inspect everything in there. It's very practical. So let, let, let's do a quick demo of that. So you can see the, the initial uh, partitioning and the floating partitioning there. And uh, um, you have all the encoding parameters that you can change uh, in real time, the quality, which prediction you want to use. So it's not very readable, sorry, it's a lot of information. But uh, you have the breakdown of the bits we use for each coefficient 
for instance, for each syntactic element. So um, the mouse is moving here, and you can see the percentage of bits used for coefficient is the breakdown like this. So it's very useful. And then you can change the partitioning algorithm to use smaller blocks. That's how we explore the possibilities. So I'm just uh, cycling through several possibilities. I can snap and use quad trees. Uh, the regular ways, for instance, to compare with the floating ones. Um, what else? Um, so we can inspect uh, the, sorry, yeah, something that I didn't mention, but segmentation is very important for images because you want to segment the image and have several features. Uh, I think it's the underused uh, uh, feature for the video that is very important for an image. And this is the segmentation map. Uh, we assign an ID different, uh, the segmentation ID for image. And you can see we try to, uh, to uh, accommodate for the com different complexity of the image and assign different quantizers uh, based on, based on, uh, on that. Um, so we pay very, uh, we take a lot of time to segment the, ID, the image properly. Um, in there. So let's look at the rest. So we have, for instance, the luminance plane. So we can compare to the original, and I can change the quality and see how it degrades uh, with the with the quantization. And then I can inspect the predictor. So for instance, I'm going to stop there. These are the predictor we use. So one thing we noticed is like we need we seem to be needing less predictors because we use this floating geometry. Because then uh, you don't need all the angles possible that we find in AV1, the 56 possibilities extra. Uh, we tried to add more. Uh, I implemented the AV1 filter, all the filter, the predictors we have in AV1, and it doesn't improve that much. I'm uh, just staying with the VP8 predictors is okay already. And the only reason I can think of is like because of the floating geometry, you don't need that many predictors. So th maybe that's a good news. We don't need that much predictors. Just the simple ones work. And so this is kind of a thing we are looking at because this is the what the predictions are. And it's pretty, it's pretty okay already. Uh, then we can look at the residuals uh, there. Uh, this is the residuals. I'm skipping forward. Same for U and V. And then we have all the, for instance, all the variants for the for the segmentation, the floating uh, partitioning is there. So I can have a look and what's uh, happening there and try to improve the algorithm. So I'm skipping a bit. And then we can inspect how many bits we spend per uh, when we change change the quality. So this is the 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 map of the bit costs for all elements and uh, for instance the, and then for all the coefficients etc cetera, etc cetera. Uh, then we can look at the error map etc cetera, etc cetera. and one thing i want to go to is like we can inspect all the blocks and see the residuals and how much bits we're spending on all the results this is the bonding box things that i i mentioned for the results and then the very last thing that i want to mention is that yeah we've got an interactive tools where we can uh, draw the partitioning we want to use because then we can make experiments for. So for instance, I don't know if you see that, but the mouse is moving and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to force some large blocks there under the mouse. So yeah, it's these green blocks uh, materializing. <clears throat> this is the block, for instance, I want to try to force to see if it improves the compression. And then I can click on a key and it will uh, recompute the partitioning by forcing these blocks. So then I can inspect and see what's the, what's the gain. So this is going to be useful to try to, to, to think of what are the good algorithms that you want to, to, to find? So for instance, another one, yep, there it goes. I've kind of recomputed all the partitioning and forcing these blocks. So this is very uh, useful uh, interactive tools. And that thing, I think that's pretty much it, yes. There we go. So if you want a live demo, I can, I can do one. Just was not practical here. Um, I'll do a switch back to the, maybe this, I'm gonna do. All right. Anyway, I'm I'm pretty I'm pretty done with that. Um, so, what's the plan for this experimentation, this web PV two? Uh, we'd like to kind of finalize the decoding tools uh, we have. Uh, we have a lot of kind of new things in there, but we want to at, at some point draw the line. And say, okay, these are the tools we think are promising. It's maybe not like the floating partitioning. It's still it's still uncertain how we can push it, but it seems to work. So we're going to freeze that. And then we can work on the encoder. And uh, of course, we have the, the code base kind of ready, but it was kind of uh, experimentation code base. But we want to release that as soon as possible so people can, can have a look. There's a, it was supposed to be open sourced uh, from the start. OK. And that's it. OK. That was fast. Um, thanks. Any question? I knew that. <laughs> Uh, so I have two questions. The first question is that for your 14-point partitioning, 
How do you do rec- floating, floating partition? Yes. Yeah, I know it's tempting. <laughs> it's floating. So for your floating, floating partition, how do you do rate control? Because I assume you said you are talking low, very low bit rates. You don't want to have partition to you need too fine. So one thing we use for the rate control is uh, I mentioned the segmentation map. And there is a very uh, important uh, parameter is what quantizer you assign to the segment. And there is a lot of segments ID, actually. Uh, we overuse the segment, like use four, five, say eight segments. So we can fine tune the quantizer we assign. And then we, uh, by tuning the quantizer, we can, uh, we can, we can uh, assign the bits differently to the large blocks and the small blocks. So that's pretty much what we're doing for yeah, the, so the rates. But I think if you are talking very low bit rates, right? you probably don't want to have a really fine partition block. Otherwise, you have too much overhead. Actually, it's not it's not that much overhead. Uh, mm-hmm. Surprisingly, actually, because it's all it's uh, we're using ANS with uh, multi symbol dictionaries, and uh, they all adapt uh, for each, for each symbols. And uh, actually, it's very flexible. I mean, it's like you, you use a lot of blocks, but you don't see it if they have overused because of adaptive probabilities. Okay, my second question is that recently there has been a lot of paper on using CNN for. Intra, uh, for uh, intra frame partitioning in video coding. Do you think that can be applied to your problem? Sorry, for using? Uh, CNN for like intra uh, keyframe, keyframe partitioning in video coding. Do you think that can be applied to your problem or do you think it's been too much overhead? Uh, I think, yeah, I, for, honestly, I, I, at that point, I don't know which, what is going to work or not. Okay. I just think, yeah, there's a lot to try, I think, but it's, uh, I think it's promising uh, to, to, to give this flexibility. Um, yeah, um, we ju- actually, the, the first algo we tried that I described here it seemed to work well enough, so we kind of trapped in a minimum, uh, local minimum for now. Uh, we need to think of some other uh, way of partitioning. So that's why we, we look at AV1 partitioning. Actually, we can uh, dump the AV1 partitioning and uh, fit that into the WebP v2 uh, partitioning to see if it works. And sometimes it works better. So AV1 is finding something we don't uh, right now. That, and some heuristics are, are missing, I guess. All right, thanks. Um. <clears throat> Uh, thank you for uh, the presentation. It was really interesting. I had a question about the floating partition. That by itself, how much is it uh, gaining in terms of RD performance? Uh, that's a thing. Uh, if you compare to WebP, it's gaining quite so. I think most of the guys are coming from uh, compared to AV1, we're losing. Uh, I mean, because uh, in AV1, you, you signal the, the, the partitioning is less complex, let's say. So you have more information. I think I can. Um, I can that, yeah, that's this. So you have AV1, for instance, and you see the partitioning. Um, pretty much, uh, actually, this is a bad example because we are gaining. Uh, the partitioning geometry is the orange uh, area, and actually, uh, what PV2 is doing better. Than that. But then we have a more overhead on the on the residuals. So yeah, that's probably a, a wrong. Case. But uh, it's sometimes uh, it's uh, it's more complex. Let's say you're losing twenty percent in geometry signaling. Over so, uh, sorry here. So let's say yeah yeah you're using a twenty percent more than orange uh, contribution here, but then you're gaining on the residuals so on the other side. Uh, it's okay. Average, how much is that? Is it like ten percent, five percent? Pretty rate. It's it's not. It's surprisingly not that. Much. I would have expected more, like twice, spending twice more bits on the geometry, uh, but it's it's far less than that actually. Uh, I would say ten percent. Uh, so. Next. Right. Easy. Oh. <laughs> um, you mentioned the uh, granularity in the decoding, like being interrupted. Yep. You also mentioned uh, interleaving alpha and uh, RGB. What is the level of interruption or level of granularity that you need to have, and how is that impacting the performance? Because if you so for web PV1, we, we did this checkpoint thing, which was uh, like every, for instance, five macro blocks, you save the state of the decoder which means uh, all the context, all the adaptive stuff needs to be checkpoint. And then whenever you, you, you realize you're missing data, you have to go back to this. So this was costly, but now we, um, we have a very, uh, sorry, I, I have some slides for that. We have a very uh, zero cost way of doing that now, uh, which is something we, we implemented all the decoder with, uh, with coroutines and fibers. So it means like you don't see, but when you, you, you're calling next byte, Maybe there's going to be a long jump inside that gives back the control to the system, wait for more bytes and come back 
to you once the more bytes are available. So you don't have to save any anything. The codec just calls next byte, uh, read next byte, next byte, and then something happens, and then it gets the byte eventually or doesn't return. So it's um, so yeah. This is the thing when you call the codec. Actually, we have a controller here, the main context uh, in blue, and it gives back the, the the control to the codec or to the system to get more bytes uh, in a, in a transparent manner. So now the like uh, it's zero cost for the codec. So um, yeah, this is uh, this is good. This is something we should have done for WebPV one. Uh, so now the yeah. So the cost for this interruption is uh, is uh, is pretty much zero so far. And uh, I would say like your your interrupted interrupted two or three times depends. Like if you have a lot of images uh, on on the page. Um, yeah. No, so Alexis, first, over here. I was a little yeah. curious for the floating partition. Are you doing currently any kind of deblocking, or is that uh, uh, so? Yeah, the deblocking we reuse the AV1 one. Uh, there is a subtlety to the inter uh, tile uh, decoding at the junction of tiles, especially since uh, each tiles can use different color space transform. So you have sure. to find a common ground. But, but do you um, do it at the end uh, because you know, like there is a dependency, so you don't probably you cannot do it. You know, like uh, yeah. So we have this rolling buffer of thirty-two. Uh, uh, so yeah, so we know exactly when we're gonna be able to to do the post processing. Sure. Actually, we can do that earlier. Actually, we have a lot of uh, uh, where you know where you are in the decoding because it's in a rolling fashion. You never know you're gonna since the larger blocks is 32 pixels. You can pretty much plan ahead what how many buffer you, you need. You never need the old picture. So, so my next question again on the same topic is uh, you know, like are you looking also at uh, hardware impact of using this because you you know like uh, since it's not as structured you're like i'm guessing that hardware decoders yeah, and encoders will be a little bit more you know problematic for for this uh, concept yeah, the, just, just curious the, the thing about hardware, yeah we're trying to actually um, more focus on the software i mean the hardware uh, for the reason i say it's not just that useful for uh, i can go into more details but for image um, like the hardware is, is, yeah, we tried it for WebPV1 and we, hardware was only gave, giving a 50% improvement in speed, but a lot of complexity. So we want to go for full software because, and the main actually hardware problem is like, it's not parallelizable. Like if you have 20 image to come to decompress, uh, you want to show them, uh, in parallel and the hardware, you can only decode one stream at a time. So it's a blocking uh, uh, for the user uh, perception. It's not good. We want to decode in parallel as many images. Even if we only show a few, uh, few rows of the image, we want to show all of them. Uh, something is happening for all of them. We don't be, want to be blocking, waiting on the hardware for each individual images. So that's the main blocking point, I think. Uh, no. Yeah, yeah. Um, I saw on your slides that you mentioned uh, HDR and 10-bit coming yep. into WebP v2. Um, but my memory from WebP1 is that the only way to signal a color profile is with an ICC profile. Is that correct? Yep. Are you planning to add any alternative mechanisms to signal the profile? Because um, I assume for 10 bits, you're going to want PQ for HDR. Yeah, we, we have a, a few bits reserved in header for, to, try, uh, to signal the transfer function. Oh, OK. Uh, yeah, because it's usually the, the usual ones. Uh, and uh, yeah, because that's and so if that's if that's signaled, you can use that instead of the ICC profile. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah, and maybe the last question over there. Yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, so some, one more question regarding the floating partitioning. Uh, so is the block size always uh, guaranteed to be power of two? Uh, uh, yes, that's practical. Yes. So if the image segmentation does not return a power of two block size, what do you what do you do? <coughs> It's always forcing to be multiples of power of two or? Yes, yes, yes. And actually we realize we don't need all the blocks variation because since they can be floating, uh, you only knew, uh, the only useful one are squares, mostly. Uh -huh. uh, you don't need the, really need the rectangle ones because you can always adjust uh, if they can float. Okay. Um, you don't really need the, the non-square one. I mean, you can use them and, uh, and it makes things uh, much easier if they are power of two. Um, but they don't need to, yeah. Square are okay, awesome. So I know, and also the transform is all, always power of two size. Yes, okay. yes. Thank you. Uh, we didn't reuse yet the the AV ones uh, different uh, transform uh, block as opposed to uh, just the block, the the prediction block. Uh, we we use the same block for transform and uh, predictions uh, yet.
Okay, one very last question now. Over the next ten minutes to go. All right. Oh, hi. Um, what's the what's the deployment plan for this um, specification? Uh, because on one side we don't want to introduce too many image formats on the web because we want to fra to fragment it too much. Yeah, the, the idea behind that was uh, like. We think uh, from experience that we have uh, some special needs for the web, uh, and uh, we wanted to explore that. And uh, like, like the way we are, we had to work around a lot of features of VPA to, to make it work for the web, and we wanted to like uh, to go to, to put the web up front and say, okay, we're going to try to make it work for the web, ready. And uh, so it's not. I mean, initially, what it's uh, experimentation uh, tool, and, and uh, yeah, we would like to to to, to make it uh, kind of a standard, but we are. We're not there yet, um, and most of all, we really want to to encourage trying to, uh, some other uh, research direction that are not coming from video, like uh, something new for images. Uh, that's so it's kind of a novel format, yes, but ready for image this time, and not just a, a byproduct of video cutting. Okay, thanks, Pascal. Right. Okay, thanks. Start your time now. There you go. Okay, so that's the end of the first day. So I'd like to thank all the presenters, maybe with another round of applause.